Good morning, everyone. I mean, it's truly my pleasure to welcome Dr. Richard Hodes here to NIEHS. He is the director of the National Institute of Aging. He received his MD degree from Harvard Medical School and then completed a fellowship, research fellowship at the Karolinska Institute and clinical training at the MGH in internal medicine and oncology at the NCI. So his research interests are focused on the cellular and molecular mechanisms that regulate the immune response. So he's published over 250 research articles. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he is a member of the National of the uh, National Academy of Medicine. So as director of the National Institute of Aging, he's working to develop a strong, diverse, and balanced research program focusing on the genetics and biology of aging, basic and clinical studies aimed at reducing disease and disability, age-related cognitive change, and investigations into the behavior and social aspects of aging. So he also directs the federal effort to treat or prevent Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And this includes a recent effort to address the role of environmental exposures into contrib the contributions to Alzheimer's disease and related uh, dementias. So just on a personal level, it's, he's been a, just a wonderful IC director to work with. Uh, he's a, actually a very careful listener in group settings. And when he has a question to ask, it's always worth listening to what he has to say. So with that said, uh, Richard, the podium is yours. And thank you again for being here with us today. Thank you, Rick. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to be with you. As, as I, I think I'll try to emphasize, and you probably already are aware, NIEHS and NIA have an awful lot in common in terms of our missions and approaches, and in fact, do a, a, a great deal of collaborating intramurally and extramurally already. So it's a, a real pleasure to come down and share with you, uh, the NIHS Council, the sense of this close association. And, and Rick, you're due for a trip for our council, too. We'll, Come in there. So I'm going to just try to go through a brief set of uh, slides and then leave plenty of time for discussion. Uh, first, just the mission of NIA. This slide really is just taken from the founding congressional legislation, but it's to emphasize the scope of research at NIA, scope of, scope of mission to support research across a broad spectrum of basic biology, uh, epidemiology, behavioral, social, economic research to foster development of the workforce through career development and training, provide research infrastructure, and then to disseminate the results of what we do. And you could probably substitute a lot of this language for your own mission as well. Um, I, I share this scheme for organizational structure largely to emphasize that for our intramural division and for our four extramural divisions, uh, they really all have strong overlap with the mission of NIH as well. So our division of aging biology is the basic biology of aging, behavior and social research speaks, I think, for itself in title, geriatrics and clinical gerontology, the more applied area of uh, basic and translational research, and the division of neuroscience, uh, currently our largest and large measure, as you'll see, due to the increased investment and targeted appropriation around Alzheimer's and related dementias. So in terms of appropriations, spending, recent trends, this you're all well aware, I'm sure, too, for this fiscal year, now that we have a budget, uh, NIH to a total of uh, some $47.7 billion. Uh, the NIA budget increases to $4.4 billion. And you'll see what a rapid increase this has been over past years, with targeting for us this year, again, of an increase for AD, Alzheimer's disease, and related dementias research. This, this just shows you the, uh, the pace of increase in our appropriations the past years. Back in 2015, just a little over one billion, up to the current four billion plus, and in blue is the amount of growth, the amount that is attributable to targeted congressional appropriation for AD and ADRD. So you can see this is where the larger component of our growth has has been, although it's been across the board for all of our areas of research. I do share with you because it's of interest to all of us what our pay lines are like now. And the fact that we have both general and AD, ADRD pay lines because of the targeted investment in Alzheimer's disease, different and, and somewhat discrepant pay lines. And you can see here at this point, uh, subject to change, we hope in a positive direction during the year, but uh, it's been a, for us and over historically a relatively good year with for the more common, less expensive grants that is direct costs under $500,000, 15th percentile. And as for all of us, new and early stage investigators getting a premium to the 18th and 20th percentile. And you can see for AD, ADRD, uh, substantially higher pay lines, the 25th, 28th, and 30th percentiles. 
This is for the NIA, the non-percentiled research support, to show once again uh, the two pay lines in general and in ADRD, as well as the emphasis we place in both on career development and fellowship awards, where there's less of a discordance between those pay lines than there is for some of our other grant mechanisms. Well, as we've had a growth uh, enormously, including that in AD and ADRD, we've taken great care to see whether we were doing a job not just of giving increased support to those people already in the field, but of recruiting people into the workforce. So in the fiscal years 2015 through 2022, when a lot of our growth has occurred, you'll see that about one third of our dementia awardees were either new or early stage investigators. About a fifth were in a category that we defined and calculated as new to the field. These are people who had never even applied for support uh, through any mechanism for Alzheimer's and related dementias. And I stress this in particular talking to you because I think we've gained a lot from the recruitment uh, and sharing of the, the ingenuity and expertise of people from many other fields coming in to work on Alzheimer's. And I know from discussions already with the intramural uh, program of yours this morning and with more to come, there's already a good deal of investment and interest in neuro neurogeneration and Alzheimer's disease, but with room for more. And one of the mechanisms we used to recruit people into the field has been this, a supplement mechanism. So for individuals from any institute or center at NIH who have grant support that is not itself AD or ADRD categorized and focused, we have been awarding the supplement programs and NIA pays for them. So you can see for NIHS, there were five uh, this past year. Uh, you can see across essentially all the institutes and centers that we've been supporting these and certainly encourage ways the the skills that people have from other institutes and in work, not nominally in Alzheimer's disease that they can bring to the field have been enormously impressive to us. The supplements themselves, very productive. And then we've recently by analysis seen what a high proportion and high success rate of people applying for the first time for Alzheimer's grants based on their work in supplements has been. So and, and encourage this continued interest. This is a slide, uh, sorry, maybe hard to, to, to read, but it's to point out across all the institutes and centers, the degree to which we have uh, been able to support uh, research. Um, and you can see here boxed for NIHS in, uh, over the years, uh, ranging from anywhere between a couple to as high as $6 million a year and looking forward to more. So through programs that include, but not limited to what I just described in terms of the supplement programs, we're anxious and interested to in in increase the already rich collaboration between our two institutes. Uh, for all of us, what permeates all we do now around health equity, I just would illustrate here, it's a complicated slide, but it's the NIA Health Disparities Framework, which was established uh, more than a, a decade ago now, uh, with the co-authors, interestingly, including Eliseo Peristabli, who then was on our council, now is, of course, director of NIMHD, and this illustrates the way in which we picture the, the health disparities and its relevance to aging across environmental, sociocultural, behavioral, and biological variables, and take it seriously in the conduct of all our, of all our research. Uh, some of the efforts we've been, may, been making of late are directed towards increasing recruitment of diverse participants uh, in clinical trials. Uh, we've done a lot, as I'll go through here, but not nearly enough of an impact. And it's still a challenge to us that we continue to have to looking for ways to promote greater diversity in our study populations. So for the past years, we've had together in public-private partnerships, a national strategy for recruitment and participation through multiple media, some of them specifically here, the Adora program, which is an online searchable database that shares best and most effective strategies for recruitment. Uh, Outreach Pro uh, has launched a, a new tool to enable health professionals to produce from the from the, te the templates we provide their own tailored outreach initiatives. And then uh, the most recent are CROMES, or Clinical Research Operations and Management System, which is, is now allowing us in near real time to track recruitment and demographic characteristics of the populations we recruit. So we're not waiting for annual reports or the periodic routine scale, but rather can see if studies are on track towards their overall recruitment and their overall diversity targets. And we hope this again is gonna make it easier to provide help to those who need it in increasing the recruitment and diversity in particular. So around some of our priorities in environmental health, uh, some groups are more vulnerable to negative health effects of the environment than others. 
uh, among the vulnerable populations tends to be those who are older. Uh, so the age of the event uh, is relevant to differential loads of cumulative exposure to particulates over the years, for example, differential burden of the impacts of socioeconomic class, differential life experiences of nearly all kinds, socioeconomic status at the time of event, uh, very much related to recovery and resilience. Uh, and uh, in, in, in just, you know, as for the definition of the exposome, the aging relevant exposome simile is a challenge for us to measure across the lifespan and even prenatal uh, impacts of exposures on the effect uh, and their effects on the uh, outcomes and quality of life with aging. So we, we share this huge overlap with you, attempts to measure all the variables we can, which are complex, but which are critical in their impact on individuals at all ages, but cumulatively over the aging process. Some of the research uh, priorities illustrated here are around environmental health, um, how health exposures shape the health outcomes of older adults, also the ways in which we can measure the timing, the duration, so time, place measurements that are uh, expanding enormously with our ability to identify where people have been uh, through real-time measurements and therefore to what, what environments they've been exposed, exposed to over days, weeks, months, and years. And then you note know, here the exposome critically important to us that so we share with you the urgency of needing to identify it, define it, measure all we can, and look for its impact across age-related health and disease. Among some of the um, infrastructure that we put into place, uh, here 2022 language uh, instructed us to develop a research infrastructure for exposome studies. Uh, in order to respond quickly, uh, we participated along with NIHS and other institutes in a supplement program some of the specifics here, giving administrative supplements to eligible awards to help build an infrastructure, uh, along with NIEHS and INDS participating in the same NOSI. Uh, some new notice of funding opportunities. So as uh, for all of you, we go through the process of presenting to our councils concepts. When the concepts are approved, funding permitted, we move forward with uh, funding opportunities. These are a couple that are announced that will be for funding in 2024. Research Coordinating Center on Exposome and Alzheimer's Disease to elucidate the role of social behavioral determinants of health on ADADRD and on, and on disparities. Uh, and this is to create a, a national coordinating center to be a hub uh, for studies looking at the impact of exposures on and particularly AD and ADRD. And to step back, the concepts that we had approved at our last council, uh, recent council meetings in September illustrated here, uh, preclinical studies to characterize the impact of toxicants on brain aging, uh, quantifying the impacts of environmental toxicants on Alzheimer's and dementia risks in cohort studies, and a third, the understanding of gene environment interactions in brain aging and Alzheimer's. So these are all concept cleared, now in the process of translating those into initiatives and announcements that will be contingent on funding and out your budgets, so our next generation of work uh, dealing very much with the overlap between environment and aging. Some of our already many uh, joint initiatives illustrated here, uh, telomere research. So uh, even, even some of my own laboratory work focusing on telomeres a decade or so or more, recognize the importance of these structures, probably well known to all of you, but these are the, the ends of chromosomes, hexanucleotide repeats and associated proteins that protect the uh, chromosome from degradation, but also as a result of incomplete replication with cell division in, in many instances, uh, serve as kind of a clock for biologic aging. That is, telomeres get shortened with age. But it doesn't happen universally or uniformly uh, with aging. It, it varies by tissue, it varies with exposures, and it's become one of the uh, now very active uh, collaborations between our two institutes stepping back a bit to recognize that even after many years of interest, the, uh, the optimal optimization of measurements of telomeres uh, has still not been completed, but I think we're well on the way with this network with a meeting next month coming up down here again uh, to further advance. And it's going to serve well, I think, our analysis of this one, we call it um, landmark or hallmark of aging. For you, it could be another landmark or hallmark of environmental exposure. Uh, they they're, they're really are one and the same. Uh, and I will be participating in the Trans-NIH Climate Change and Health Initiatives. Uh, several of the NOCES that are illustrated here, Climate Change and Health, uh, Innovative Technologies for Climate Change and, and Human Health, 
through small business, um, SBIR, STTR, uh, for us a very much expanded program. And we brought on board uh, just this month, Dr. Zheng Kong as a 2023 NIH Climate and Health Scholar. Uh, she comes uh, uh, to us from University of Alabama and will work with NIA and across institutes to particularly look for opportunities related to advance impact of extreme weather, disaster, and other environmental exposures on older adults. So I'm sure she'll be interacting with you as well. We are participating in the NIHS Target 2 program to look at uh, establishing a research consortium to examine the role of environment for us very much with aging. And uh, in FY21 provided co-funding to support uh, some of the multi-omic exposure studies. We anticipate being very intimately and actively involved in the continuation of this program. Uh, just a, a list of some of the uh, clinical relevant linkages between environmental intoxicants and Alzheimer's disease that have been funded uh, in a prior program announcement issued here. Uh, these that are administered by NINDS and, and funded by NIA and look at a variety of ways in which uh, the e exposures and environment are impacting the risk and course and progression of cognitive decline with aging and dementias. Some relevant NIA advances just want to share with you in particular. Um, this one, the, the, the title indicates epigenetic age measured by um, a complex epigenetic clocks predicts the rate of cognitive decline with aging. So what you can see, we'll see how this uh, pointer works. With uh, advanced age, there is an increase in error me measures in this Benton visual retention test, which is one cognitive change. So they, those errors increase with age. Those are the slopes. But you can see those three slopes, if one parses out the, um, the, uh, the effect of cognitive, uh, effect on cognitive outcomes of the epigenetic change, that there is a real, very strong statistical, statistical significance. Interestingly, when it was further looked at by sex, there was no significant association in women, but there was only in men a strong association of epigenetic clock measured here and rate of increase in errors that is therefore cognitive decline with aging. Uh, provocative in, in, in many ways, including the, the sex difference, which we've uh, taken to be an important variable in all the studies we carry out. Another acute exposure, um, I'm, I'm sure that great attention paid by all of us, including NIHS, was the World Trade Center exposure. And here, a couple of, of studies that looked at the effect of the length of duration of, of exposure to, uh, to pollutants uh, on the x-axis uh, and a measure of hippocampal and cerebral white matter changes. And uh, their statistical significance here, particularly in those who have the APOE4 genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's, showing that a correlation of the exposure around the World Trade Center events uh, with subsequent uh, neuroinflammatory effects. And over time, we'll see if this translates as, into cognitive functional changes as well, but uh, a, a tragic example uh, from which we hope we can salvage uh, information that will help us in the future. Uh, animal models, again, another uh, natural disaster, Hurricane Maria. Uh, this study looked at the impact on the macaques who were living in an island near Puerto Rico. So these are free living macaques that have been studied uh, by NIA and other investigators for quite some time. And here it was done because we had serial blood samples from them for many years, including immediately before and after the hurricane, was to look at the impact on genetic changes. So uh, about 4% of macaque genes were differentially expressed before and after the hurricane. And about 40% of these were associated with uh, aging, that is genes whose expression changes with aging. So you can call it an accelerated aging, but this is a pretty dramatic effect in uh, an animal population, non-human primates, in which a natural disaster has accelerated uh, the change in genetic expression that we usually associate with aging. Uh, precisely what the mediators are, not known. Uh, we can include simple things. For example, uh, interestingly, uh, they were not deprived of food during this time because uh, the even during Hurricane Maria, uh, the provision of food to these animals was maintained, their housing was maintained. So what other aspects of the environmental stress and that acute exposure it is, uh, very relevant to understanding what happens when humans are expressed to stress of, of this kind. 
Um, among the aspects of environment that are critical, but also very challenging to measure, uh, the socioeconomic uh, environmental aspects. Here, if one looks at disadvantaged neighborhoods that are categorized uh, by a, a parameters relating to income, housing, green space, crime, uh, and a variety of such indices, the finding was that if you look at the percentage of individuals uh, with uh, the percentage of remaining life to be lived with disability, so that is as age increases, the percentage of life lived with disability sadly increases. But notice the difference between these two non disadvantaged and advantage. Uh, those who have been living in disadvantaged neighborhoods have a, a greater increase in the pace of uh, life with disability. And, and similarly, if one looks in another study at the outcomes following an acute intensive care unit hospitalization, at what the persistence of disability is in years after discharge, the difference between these two lines show that those who were who had the most disadvantaged backgrounds uh, continue to have the greater disability after ICU discharge compared to others. So these are persisting effects, decrease in resilience, resilience after will to an acute illness, even after a similar starting point in terms of level of disability. Just to share with you finally some upcoming events, I hope you will find uh, of interest to participate. Uh, the National research summits on Alzheimer's disease have been of three flavors. One is Alzheimer's disease research. Another is Alzheimer's related dementias research. And this is the third uh, on care services and support for persons living with dementia and their partners. This is gonna be a virtual meeting held next month and encourage your participation. Um, just as we, or even as we are embarking upon trying to understand the underlying pathologies and prevent or slow the, the, the progression of Alzheimer's related dementias, a critical need exists now for identifying the best means to care for those with Alzheimer's uh, and every bit as uh, much a need for rigorous research as those other categories. So uh, for those interested, again, in impacts of socioeconomic um, and other environmental impacts and the way in which they, they affect the care and, and it, uh, trajectory of those currently living with dementia, Geroscience. So uh, I don't know if the, the term is so universal as to be familiar to all of you or not, but but it, it, it's a, it's a convergence of the observation that with age, with aging in animals, including humans, there are a variety of changes, uh, biological changes which occur that are associated with aging. Uh, they are multiple. They are such things as telomere length. They are involve uh, the ability to repair DNA damage. Uh, the ability to repair uh, protein, uh, uh, misform, misform proteins. Uh, collectively, they predict and correlate with aging and the health and disability of aging. And therefore, geroscience is a science which posits that if we can understand those biological events that occur with aging, that we may understand the underpinnings of the increased risk of multiple chronic diseases with aging, and therefore impact not see not even more than a single disease at a time, but slower trajectory of many chronic diseases. So this is the fourth now summit on this topic, uh, a lot on environmental exposures uh, to be sure in this agenda. This so far, we're going to hope to hold as a, as a hybrid with a meeting on campus if uh, COVID and circumstances allow and encourage your registration here. And finally, the Butler Williams Scholars Program. This is for many years now been a program in which junior faculty and researchers new to the field uh, come for an intensive week long uh, experience. Was in person, but for the last couple of years, virtually and very effectively so. Uh, they have an opportunity not only to hear from speakers in the field of aging, uh, but to talk to program staff to go through a generation and mock review of their own proposals. And we found in the end to form a very effective uh, networking opportunities for people in the field of aging. Uh, a number of NIHS uh, grantees and students have uh, participated and I hope there'll be more to come. And finally, just a variety of the ways in which we hope we make it easy to stay informed about what's happening on, new funding opportunities and new uh, results of 
uh, research supported by NIA at these several points, and we'll make these slides available, of course, so the links uh, will be, be there for you. And let me stop there, and I hope with uh, time to talk about anything you like having to do with the multiple interests and commonalities across NIA and NIHS. So let me ask the to you, the end user and Zoom, to queue up for your question. So, uh, to get things started with a question. Um, so, within the landscape of, of ADRG, you know, how much does this feed into cerebral vascular and multi in this uh, dementia as well? Yeah, great question. So, by, by, by definition, in the National Alzheimer's Project Act, Related dementias were defined as uh, Lewy body disease, frontotemporal dementia, and vascular components of dementia, which is along the lines of what you're discussing. And fact is, uh, when studies have been done looking at the pathology of individuals diagnosed with dementia, that a large proportion of them have mixed pathologies, uh, among which um, vascular pathologies are extremely common. And as you might guess, those become more common with age. So with some of the autosomal dominant early onset, rare but, uh, but tragic familial cases of Alzheimer's, they're rather pure often in their Alzheimer's amyloid tau pathologies. Uh, as we get into the more frequent uh, dimensions of aging, more and more commonly, there is uh, a co-occurrence of pathologies, including vascular. Um, that's very relevant too, in terms of interventions, preventive measures. So when a few years ago, uh, the 2017 report to be precise from the National Academies, we commissioned an analysis of what the evidence was for effective interventions to prevent age-related cognitive decline or dementia. The answer was there was nothing for which there was sufficient evidence to merit a public health campaign. But there were three areas that were judged to be promising. One was blood pressure control, uh, another was exercise, another was cognitive training and experience. And shortly thereafter came the, the SPRINT study which many of you will remember was a study of more or less intensive control of blood pressure. It was a study that was stopped prematurely because the group with more intensive control of blood pressure did better in terms of cardiovascular morbidities and death. We similarly were carrying out in parallel the so-called sprint mind study in which we're doing cognitive testing and MRI measures of the brain. And although the study overall was stopped early, it was sufficient to, there was sufficient evidence in the, even the truncated follow-up to see that the more intensive control of blood pressure did have a significant effect on age-related cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment, formation of white matter densities, which are attributed to vascular lesions in the brain. So it's the, really the one case of a randomized clinical trial with an impact on prevention of Alzheimer's disease. Roundabout coming back to your question, uh, as we're looking for targeting amyloid or targeting tau or many other genetic risk factors we found, uh, in the short term, and maybe even in the long term, it's gonna be uh, equally important to be looking at some of the preventive factors around uh, vascular lesions. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, actually, I found it very refreshing. You know, often when we think about universal susceptibility, we focus on the neonates and what happens in utero. It's really nice to see uh, the institute taking on the issue of aging. Um, my question to you, however, is um, uh, as the population continues to age, uh, you must have projections on the impact of neurodegenerative disease that the age, aging population increases. So I wonder if you could comment on that. And also, whether or not you have any data whatsoever to indicate what the impact is of uh, senior living in terms of uh, home care for seniors. Uh, especially uh, uh, places where seniors might not be dividing, whether or not this is uh, a useful endeavor or whatever actually increases their susceptibility. Yeah, great question. So, in terms of projections of uh, future numbers of people with Alzheimer's related dementias, uh, most of the studies, uh, and, then, then, and the most recent of them are still a few years old, uh, are really just uh, taking known risk factors and census projections of the number of people in age groups and are extrapolating from there. Uh, there have been, however, some recently in intriguing data to suggest that the incidence of Alzheimer's may be slowing or plateauing, correlating with such things as 
history of prior education because education is 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 increased levels or years of education are one of the important uh, statistical risk factors uh, for re re reduced likelihood of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, we, we probably reached a plateau in the advantage there since we've come to a point now where most everybody graduates, has graduated from high school and a bit beyond. But that, that's an example in, in response to your question about what our projections or projections are. We have to adjust it for risk factors there. The, the apparent plateau, some have argued recently has been reversed, maybe because of increases in obesity, untreated hypertension as risk factors for a dementia as well. And then most recently, in terms of environmental exposure, COVID. So there are data which suggests that for individuals uh, who have had Alzheimer's disease previously diagnosed, that exposure to COVID has accelerated cognitive decline. And some more, some earlier, uh, but, but still suggestive evidence that the incidence of onset of Alzheimer's may have increased as a result of COVID exposure. Uh, Far from conclusive, but if it's true, now there's a whole new calculation. How many people have been exposed at what age to COVID and what does that do to projection? So short answer, there are so many variables that have changed beyond what we understood even a few years ago that it's hard to say. But the increased number of people at advanced age is likely to over overwhelm any advantage we have in any of the pre preventive factors that we've seen so far. So it can lead to a net increase. Y your question about... Uh, settings for people with various levels of dementia. Um, you know, it, it, this summit that I mentioned coming up, it, we'll, we'll look at, at all of this. The, the, the relative advantages, disadvantages, risks, benefits of continuing to live at home, live at home with assistance, live in, in, uh, in, in communal settings, uh, depends very much, of course, on the stage of dementia and what the care needs are. But you mentioned specifically what we saw with uh, the, the COVID epidemic, that when people are living in aggregate settings, whether they're kids in school or older adults living in, in nursing homes, uh, they are at higher risk and there's no question. It's also a, a place where we've been able because of some um, nursing home based research to very quickly see the outcomes of COVID. So the very first uh, evidence for the safety of COVID vaccines came in almost real time and a vast network of nursing homes that were being tracked, uh, and as people were being vaccinated or immunized, to, to look at adverse outcomes or at, uh, subsequent events, and happily saw safety and immunization there. But yeah, you know, it's a very personal thing. The uh, the, the, the risks benefits of moving into communal settings sometimes in terms of quality of life enormously useful, but we have to be careful then to protect the the vulnerabilities of people living in, co in close proximity. Traditionally, it's been thought that. Delaying time to leaving a home, the delay of needing nursing home or other institutionalization is a victory. And it's probably a reasonable perspective, but there are times in which individual decisions probably are in the direction of it being better for an individual and family at a given point in time to turn to a more supportive environment that can be given at home. And obviously, it's a good idea that you get to zone. Um, one of the things we're looking at in this research coordinating center is very much focused on the social and behavioral aspects, which to me are an underrated area. So I'm very happy about that. Um, but the concern is like how we link that back to the more physical and chemical parts and into the sort of multi omic imaging, all the other data that we have out there. And it seems like a good opportunity for the two institutes to kind of work together and see how we could build. A group of research coordinating centers or something to help pull Yeah, absolutely. But, but, I, but I should add, even, even for these, which are going to be looking um, at the behavioral, social uh, aspects of environment, uh, we've, we've we've learned to try to avoid missed opportunities. And in most of the studies, and likely these as well, we will concurrently be trying to measure exposures and looking at uh, at the very at the very least at some of the um, the, the the exposome related. Um, measurable variables that we can now. Certainly easy things to be saving serum, blood, cells, uh, to be looking at such things as telomere length, to be looking at epigenetic marks and clocks for, for correlations between the social demographic um, uh, parameters and some of the in, internal reflection of those biologically. So couldn't agree more. We I think we're, we're very much aware that any of the studies we're doing 
particularly in human populations over time, studying environmental variables and exposures, it would be a, a tragedy to miss the opportunity to be able to, to, to measure some of the biologic implications and reflections of those exposures. But all, all the better if we can do some of this uh, work together. Richard, uh, a very important uh, environmental variable is nutrition and diet. So where, where, where are we relative to caloric restriction as a way of, of enhancing lifespan? And does any of that apply to you know, Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's related diseases? Yeah, and thanks for again. It's been a very active level of air research for a long time. The, 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 the earliest demonstration of an intervention that would prolong life in rodent models was caloric restriction. And, and uh, since then, there have been in rodent models, for example, uh, examination of the, the mediating pathways. And I'm sure you've been reading about the uh, use, not just of caloric restriction, but of intermittent fasting and pseudo caloric restriction and all these variables, which are being studied actively now in, in many animal model systems. And moving up to non-human primates, uh, there, in, in, in rhesus macaques, there were studies carried out in parallel at the Poolsville campus of the intramural NIA and in Wisconsin, uh, both calorically restricting and looking at outcomes. Uh, one showed an extension of lifespan, the other not. When they were looked at in more detail, Rick, it, it turned out that although they were getting isocaloric diets, one was mostly natural. The other was synthetic, so they weren't the same. And in fact, the group that did better seemed to be working, have, have had a more uh, natural nutrients exposed. But um, th that study will probably never be done again. You know, it's a 20 or 30 year study in macaques. In humans, uh, the first, the best example of a, of a long-term caloric restriction randomized control study in humans was CALORIE, it's an acronym, a C-A-L-E-R-I-E. Um, and and uh, was aiming at a in, in, in non-obese uh, individuals uh, to reduce intake caloric intake by twenty five percent. Actually, reduced on average about twelve percent. This was for a couple of years. So as these studies go, that's a relatively long term. And then the, there was have been since then. Of course, can't tell what's going to happen with longevity. But but many uh, of the mediating uh, biologic health correlates such as blood pressure, uh, other uh, lip lipid metabolism. Uh, more recently published uh, a look even at some of the uh, epigenetic changes in these individuals. And, and it does look as though those interventions have that intervention in particular, a caloric restriction in non-obese individuals uh, was able to alter risk factors and correlates in the direction of slowing age-related parameters and risk factors for cardiovascular disease in particular. Some adverse effects, a little bit of uh, ad adverse consequence for bone density. So always you know, keep keeping in mind what we need to do to compensate, but bone density lower, but so is body weight. So it needs to be corrected for that. So all to say, there are a lot of, of, of complex aspects of interpretation, but in, in humans, that is one. And now to be carried out, to be funded, are some studies in humans. This is to answer the, 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 the question of these all, all these variable kinds of diets, specifically other than caloric restriction, intermittent, intermittent fasting uh, on various schedules, comparing two or more of these interventions in humans for a, a study uh, to, to see how, how their relative performance is, since clearly some are going to be more or less feasible and acceptable in human populations. So it's still there, uh, still a lot of evidence for positive impacts but just uh, how much restriction, what schedule, under what circumstances, with what assurance of complete uh, nutrition on, in, in addition to the caloric restriction. And next up is Andrew Geller. Hi, Dr. Hodes, Andrew Geller from the EPA. It's great to, um, it's great to see that, um, that NIA is attending to diversity and, uh, and health disparities in its work going forward. Is NIA part of the HHS Unite effort on structural oh, yes. racism? Yeah, yeah. So um, absolutely. Um, so you're probably all, all aware of Unite and its acronym for the various aspects of, of uh, diversity inclusion. Um, and the, the head of Unite, for example, uh, or the head of senior leadership in, in, in um, Unite is from... Um, Marie Bernard, who was for, until she moved to that position, 
was for 12 years the, the deputy director of MNIA. We were fortunate enough to have her. So yes, and it, this continues with uh, our staffing among those in leadership roles and, and all of the unite components and activities, absolutely. Great, and, and just as a follow-up, um, can you talk about racial disparities as independent from economic disparities since, for example, I mean, we, we see very, we see differences in, in environmental exposures and health disparities. Um, so are racial disparities a focus, for example, of the increased uh, Alzheimer's funding? Yes, absolutely. So just some easy stock figures, the, the, uh, the, the relative risk of Alzheimer's disease in African Americans is about twice that in uh, Caucasian non-Hispanics. In Hispanics, it's about one and a half times. When one tries to break that out, as as your question uh, uh, and, and asks, how much of that is due to what what it is to be black or white? How much is socioeconomic? How much is environmental exposures? Uh, all, all all yet to be determined. Uh, one one study of of, of interest that I, I know that NIEHS is now collaborating with is the, the Handles study in in Baltimore, which in Baltimore communities uh, using uh, mobile vans to go out into the community and be able to do biological measurements as well as interact closely with the populations. This was carefully constructed to look at socioeconomic status and black white uh, racial ethnic differences, so that they could be dissociated. And, and, and some interesting findings, as you might suspect, some of the differences one is seeing in health outcomes and risk factors and biologic metrics are correlating with socioeconomic status. Some appear to be related to um, race, racial ethnic status beyond socioeconomic status. But now what, what that reflects, um, how much is genetic, how much is early life exposures, stress, racism, what, 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 whatever the, the whatever constitutes the the that whatever goes into racial ethnic differences yeah. uh, so all, all being studied extremely uh, extremely vigorously if you if you look at the pathology of dementias also across um, racial ethnic groups a higher proportion of vascular pathology a question asked earlier in african americans for example and in caucasians hypertension we know is more frequent and more common and associated so uh it's we're as we're learning more and more, it's, it's clear the circumstances are more and more complex. And, and that simply regarding even just a, what we, we call clinically Alzheimer's disease as a single entity is not going to do justice to our understanding racial ethnic differences or, or any other uh, dimension that allows us to intervene most appropriately in individuals. Thank you very much. And our final question, I think, is going to be from Irva hertz Uh I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I've been doing some work on wildfires, and um, one, of the, one of the big lessons I've been sort of opened up my eyes to is um, there are many different vulnerable populations, uh, and and it, it depends on sort of where in a in a disaster, you know, what point time point in the disaster you're looking at, and uh, but certainly one of those vulnerable populations um, is the aging population, uh, which Sometimes it could have to do with, you know, mobility problems, having difficulty, you know, evacuating quickly as fires are coming closer and um, things like that. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think that there's a, a lot of opportunity for really understanding some of the, also the longer term impacts um, of disasters, which seems to, you know, quite universally, whether you're talking about wildfires, floods, you know, uh, hurricanes and, su and such, um, the mental health impacts seem to have a lot of longevity um, from the literature. And um, I, I would think that that would translate into maybe more rapid um, decline. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's something actually we'll be able to, we, we do have a longitudinal cohort, so we're, we're going to be looking at that. And it strikes me, I've, I've been looking at the data, but I haven't actually looked at the older population in, in, in those terms at this point in time. The other um, example where I think um, the older population is, is of great interest is for heat stress, where you know, we know that older people are much more sensitive to heat stress. And um, right now we're, we're 
starting to collaborate. The state of California uh, has some concerns about that the CDC has come up with certain thresholds for when to set up cooling centers. And some of the, I've talked to some of the county uh, medical officers who feel that that threshold is a little bit too high and that there's a lot of bad health problems happening below the threshold. And, and so we're, we're actually applying for funding right now from, from California to look at, um, at altering those thresholds and, and coming up with different algorithms or you know, lower um, thresholds to, and, and looking at past historic data to see what the you know, hospitalizations and mortality and so forth are um, at levels below that. So, um, and then again, you know, the older population seems like really ripe for, for focused studies on, on, on some of those things. So oh, we would we'd love to find more opportunities to work with you on this. One of the challenges that we've seen, and you, you sort of alluded to it, is um, the, what we're, we're usually we're doing historical controls to a population that's just been exposed uh, to an environmental disaster. Uh, we don't have immediate pre-post, so we're, we're, we, we pick control populations we think are the right ones. And that's that's been challenging. So what you refer to as longitudinal exposure populations would be uh, very important ones uh, for us. Uh, it, it must be a challenge you face too when you're trying to understand what the effect has been of some acute exposure yeah. to find the, the, the control population uh, if, if you don't have extensive pre-post measurements in some of those cases. Yeah, and, and from the point of view of the smoke pollution, it's virtually everybody. So not everybody has to evacuate, but... Um, that's there's almost nobody at certain times of the year you look at the air quality index map and everything is you know orange and above and then but you look you, obviously you're the, the lead of looking at sort of do, dose dose effects there for some clue yeah as, as to what causalities may be exactly yeah thanks Thank you again, Dr. Hodes, for the, for the visit, the presentation, and stimulating discussion. Thank uh, you again for great great discussion, great. the chance to be here. So our next presentation is a, a, a concept uh, for a, a potential program uh, being presented by Dr. Yusha Yush Chui uh, from the Exposure Response and Technology Branch uh, on a global exposome research coordination uh, to accelerate precision environmental health. Yusha. Okay, um, as David mentioned, you know, the new uh, the concept I will present is a new program for global exposome research coordination uh, to accelerate precision environmental health. Just a quick overview of uh, what I will be presenting first. I will give a very brief introduction about the exposome concept and how it led to a new paradigm to study environmental health. And then I'll explain why um, global coordination is needed as the field is advancing. And then we'll focus on what the program is about before we open the discussion uh, to, to questions and comments. The exposome concept uh, is defined as a totality of exposures to which an individual is subjected from conception to death. It was first coined by uh, Dr. Chris Wild in 2005. And there are two key elements in this concept. The first is entirety, that is every exposure that's non-genetic, and also the temporality, which is a lifetime and a cumulative. Um, so you have seen this figure yesterday from Dr. Wojcik's talk. So um, it's really hard not to use this statistic figure without, um, you know, when you talk about the exposome concept. So what I really want to emphasize here is that uh, the concept of exposome is really about to bring all the domains together, all the different perspectives together, because um, it's a combination of all the factors and together with the genetics that shape our health and disease. The study of the exposome, also known as exposomics, um, has led to a paradigm shift in the last decade or so. So this graph shows exposome publications per year in PubMed uh, from 2005, when the first exposome paper was published until 2022. Um, as you can see, you know, there's a significant increase in the number of publications each year. 
which uh, is an indication of rapid growth of the field. And this is supported by major investment in exposome research around the world, uh, from the Japan Environment and Children's Study, also known as JAXA, and also the exposome projects funded by the European FP7 program, and the recent formation of the European Human Exposome Network, which consists of nine projects um, with over 100 million uh, euros for four, for four years. In the United States, NIH has funded the first exposome center, uh, which is called uh, Hercules Center at Emory University. And in 2015, um, the Children's Health Exposure Analysis Resource uh, was established using the um, National Children's Studies money. As a continuation in 2019, the Human Health Exposure Analysis extended the, the service to cover um, exposures uh, to uh, of life stage. And now it is a trans-NIH program supported by NIHS, NCI, Partner Long, as well as ECHO program. I also want to point out that NIEHS uh, has been at the forefront in catalyzing the field by organizing uh, community discussions around the exposome concept, uh, exposome uh, topic that involved national and international experts. Uh, later in my discussion, I will talk about the exposomics workshop series last year and what we learned from there and how it's related to the new program we're proposing. Uh, in addition to the program, in addition to this uh, exposome initiatives mentioned above, many NIH-funded programs are embracing the concept and, in, and try to capture both genetic and environmental contributions in their health research. The ECHO program uh, is conducting comprehensive exposure analysis uh, to look at the early life exposure, how that impacts children's health and development. ECHO um, utilizing a kind of leverage peer program to, uh, for the biospecimen analysis. They also established advanced geospatial uh, infrastructure and data sets so the, geospatial, so the location based data can be incorporated into their analysis. And in Dr. Hode's um, presentation, you heard the investment on exposome and Alzheimer's disease. Um, I particularly want to point out the 2022 AD, ADRD exposome supplements and also remind you about the future, uh, the funding opportunities that are coming. The All of Us program is a disease agnostic program which will re recruit more than, one uh, more than 1 million participants. Uh, so their goal is to build a resource for researchers to ask uh, health-related questions at the intersection of environment, lifestyle, and biology. And last but not least, the NINDS has a dedicated office uh, to support neural exposome and toxicology, uh, which supports research that on um, how exposome impacts brain and nervous system development. So with the increased recognition and also adoption of the exposome concept, by the national and the international community. So there is an urgent need or critical need for uh, coordinating the, the resources and methods as we move forward. In 2022, um, last summer, IHS uh, held um, a series of workshops to gather the community to discuss the challenges, opportunities uh, in exposomics research. Dr. Wojcik talked about this yesterday. I just want to remind you that this workshop series attracted a large number of participants around, around the globe and many, many, discuss, many discussions um, and also a wide range of topics identified to advance the field. And the workshop series was followed by a summit meeting to further discuss high priority topics and also thinking about the pathways forward um, on uh, how to operationalize exposome research. Uh, so while, the, while a large number of recommendations came from the exposomics workshop series, they so largely fall into five areas uh, from what to measure, how to measure, 
and how to share data, analyze data, and to how to translate the results. So uh, for each area, I also listed two high priority topics. So this is a reflection of how the community thinks what should be addressed under each area in order to advance the field. So together they cover the entire research cycle of exposomics from you know, study design, data collection to data analysis integration to translation of results. While all these recommendations and the domain specific recommendations are very important, uh, the summit meeting came to a consensus that the first step to tackling these issues is to establish a community of practice. So there are several reasons. First, you know, it was quickly recognized that there's a lack of guiding principles for collecting uh, exposomics in many areas, such as how study design, data quality standards, and data sharing, harmonizations, so on and so forth, and communication of results. And another theme emerged from the summit meeting discussion is that we need a cultural change in sharing methods, data, and resource, which will not ha happen unless we work closer together as a community. And similarly, you know, education, communication, and the training also requires community efforts. So at the end of this summit meeting, we essentially proved uh, what we have emphasized actually from the very beginning of the workshop series, that is collaboration will be central to our success. Around the same time period, uh, the European Commission released the call to support a program to support global coordination of exposome research. They um, provided a number of activities, activities that the program will cover, although in different shape and form, those activities actually align very well uh, with what we learned from the exposomics workshop series and the summit meeting. And they particularly point out the importance of leverage and engage with the efforts within the United States. So based on the workshop series and also the European Call for Global uh, Exposome Research Coordination, we propose this new program, which I'll talk about in the next few minutes. So the overall goal of this program is to develop a commonly agreed upon framework for exposomics, promote the best practices in data collection, sharing, and analysis, and build a global exposome research community of diversity and inclusion to foster national and international collaborations. To achieve these goals, um, we expect the program will work in three areas, uh, which I will give examples um, under each. The first area of activity is to develop a common agreed upon conception of framework, framework for exposomics. Uh, we think there are many fundamental questions still to be addressed to, to operationalize exposomics. Uh, first of all, as you already heard from Dr. Holdens, so there's, although the concept is clear, but it's very broad. It's, the exposome in, encompasses every exposure that's not genetic. Not, that's not genetic. So there has been kind of long-lasting confusion in terms of what can be measured, what should be measured in an exposome study. So we hope the conception of framework will address that. And there was also robust discussion about uh, what's the role of animal models and the immature systems in exposomics. Uh, one of them being that. Um, we can use animal models and the eventual system to help us narrow down the, the, the elements that we should measure in human studies, and there should be more. Additional questions to be addressed that are important um, include essential technologies, methodologies to support exposomics, and also the data standards and the data infrastructure needs, as well as how to apply exposomics uh, to advance precision environmental health at both community and individual levels. So in a second area of activities, um, we expect that the program will help identify methods that are, ready, that are ready for scaling up and also develop performance standards. So those methods can be uh, adapted by those who want to conduct exposomics in their research. Uh, this cannot be done in isolation, uh, so the program will work with 
many ongoing efforts and, and including international efforts uh, try to look into this question. Another activity is to organize round robin activities to promote interlab and cross-platform comparability. Um, we don't realize how different our methods are uh, until we work on the same set of materials or the same data set. I think that's, that can be a, a very important first step to more harmonizable approach and more reproducible results. Additional activities can include uh, create quality control materials to facilitate cross-study um, harmonization, identify future needs in technology and methodology, and also disseminate uh, the standard, standardized methods, best practices, etc. So under the third area of acti activity about a build, uh, build a global exposed on research community, uh, we hope the program will work with the European counterpart to develop a global governance structure to so uh, a global community can sustain. Um, we also hope the program will identify opportunities for future collaboration in data mining, harmonization, and integration uh, leveraging ongoing efforts. And last but not least, to provide education, training, and outreach uh, to promote and expose a community of diversity and inclusion. Uh, we mentioned that, uh, quite a bit about uh, the ongoing existing efforts. I'm giving you, you a, a list of examples, but this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, this include NIHS-led NIH programs, or NIH programs or other national and international programs. And this is how we hope this pro program will work with the partners within the United States and also the counterpart program in Europe, as well as um, other international efforts to work on um, high level issues. Um, but the focus obviously will be within the United States. We have high expectations for the program. Uh, we've, uh, we're looking for a tangible framework for exposomics that can be readily um, adopted by those who want to conduct exposom uh, exposomics in their research. And we hope to see more standardized or harmonizable methodologies that can be utilized. And I also want to see a change, a positive change in methods and the resource sharing. As a result, we hope new proposals and ideas will be um, you know, generated for other IC, not other ICs, but all the ICs to support. We also want to see increased capacity in exposomics as a community, especially in, in places where environmental problem is more prominent and uh, education is most needed. We also want to see gaps and unmet needs being identified so we can focus our future efforts to advance um, precision health. Um, we imagine the program need to be conducted by a multidisciplinary team uh, with domain specific and also complementary expertise. Although they don't need to do the research by themselves, they need to understand the, the field as a whole very well. We want them to be highly collaborative and also have the ability and vision uh, to work with international partners. Uh, because resource, um, sh resource share coordination and, and methods coordination is a major goal of this program. So we think U U24 uh, will likely to be used uh, with a significant step in involvement from NIH. I think that's the end of my presentation and I'm going to invite our council reviewers, uh, Dr. Trevor Penny and Dr. Herb, um, Perdue <laughs> to, to give their comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ku, for that uh, presentation. I mean, the vision is very important to be able to oper operationalize, expose on research, and develop a community of practice, which you alluded to. Um, and it's going to be a challenge because there's so many different partners here, but it doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, as the expose on research field continues to grow, we're going to have more and more individuals embracing the exposome concept in the way they do their research without standards in place 
we're going to be in a real problem area in how to share data. And uh, I'm reminded of the FAIR principles, which everyone is familiar with, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. So unless we have good data ontologies in place and good metadata and metadata ontologies, we will not be able to compare one study with another. So I think this is exceptionally important. So you have, you have my support as a council member to move forward with this, this initiative. Um, I'm struck by when we come to uh, the exposome, the very large or vast domains that we want to integrate. And uh, I think this comes back to something I know the Institute is actually working on, which is the Environmental Health Language Collaborative. We need to be speaking the same language. We need to be discussing things in the same terms. I would give you one example, which is very uh, uh, unique perhaps to Penn. But before we had EPIC, we had different ways of reporting gender. We had M and F. We had a circle with an arrow and a circle with a cross. Right, and we had one and two. So, you know, the importance of having standards in terms of what we're talking about is going to be fundamental in bringing this uh, forward. One of the other things I think that needs to have some uh, uh, thought is we've talked about all these domains. But one of the very important domains is the electronic health record. And uh, uh, there is a large amount of information that can be extracted from electronic health records, starting with zip code, especially if you're going to do geospatial analysis. But as you are well aware, the EPIC structure is not um, uh, normalized across health system. And this creates a real problem for us. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Odyssey, which is the Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics and Health Data, Na Data Network, which is actually trying to tackle this very issue in terms of actually taking advantage of electronic health records and to, to, and to produce a natural language algorithm. Um, physicians' notes, as opposed to looking at ICD-9 codes. So I think that's one very important challenge that perhaps needs to be embraced as we operationalize the exposome. Um, also, uh, I think when it comes to social determinants of health, I don't think anyone in the room is going to uh, debate the fact that social determinants of health is a driver of how we actually uh, respond to lifetime exposures. So we need to oper operationalize how we are going to actually take into account social determinants of health. And we do have these FENEX uh, um, uh, questionnaires, but they obviously have to be um, used uh, uh, throughout exposomics, logically based studies. And I think the other challenge we have is the integration of these domains once we have collected data in them. And uh, as you say, it's not just the entirety of the exposure, but it's the, the spatial and temporal relationship as well. And until we can come up with a framework, which this U24 hopefully would establish, we will have be uh, very challenged to do exposome-wide association studies, which is at the end of the day, one of the outcomes of this initiative. Um, I think that the community uh, of exposed um, research that you want to establish is going to be, uh, uh, has a very solid foundation in terms of the various initiatives that are occurring both here at the Institute and other institutes as well. But maybe we need to start at home and make sure that the various institutes that are taking on this initiative are actually working together to operationalize what they're doing at the level of the NIH as a whole. And then we can actually start thinking about taking this further forward with, um, uh, uh, say, the economic uh, European Union and the Horizon Initiative. 
But I think there is a solid foundation to make this happen. And I think at the end of the day, uh, I was mentioned Mr. Dr. Wojciech yesterday, I'm a great believer in keep it simple, stupid. And so there's huge amounts of data out there that are gonna have to be integrated, but we need to know if there's something simple we can do to show proof of principle. Is this effort going to be worthwhile in actually pushing the envelope and improving public health, right? And so maybe we think about the big picture, but also a smaller picture as well. And the challenge we face, I think, and U24 included, is we can come up with best practices for a community of practice in the exposed zone. But the key to success is the, adopt is the adoption of those best practices. So words are cheap, implementation is hard. So that's, that's the challenge and hopefully the U24 will get us where we want to be. But overall, I think this is really timely, especially following the Expose Zones workshops we had this summer. And it certainly brings together all the different features of what we've, we've all been thinking about. So I congratulate you on this. Yeah, thank you. Well, sure. I'll move closer to you. Uh, well, as always, uh, Trevor puts out puts in eloquent, uh, you know, poetry practically. Um, many of the same ideas that that uh, you know came to my mind and you know even some of the same words i was going to say this is a very timely you know it's at the end of um of a whole series of activities that the institute uh organized um including particularly the the, the that last set of the the five workshops that um led to the summit and um the amount of participation the sort of vibrant really you know, free flowing discussion that just, you know, took us all over the map and and back. And uh, I think it it was a um, it, it was really exciting um, to sort of hear some you know big really big ideas coming together in 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 one place um, and um, engaging so many people in that process. I understand it was like. 400 people total or something like that. So um, I think this is uh, this concept proposal in, is in a way maybe the first really tangible fruit out of that and um, uh, you know, sort of a, a first step forward uh, uh, with how to now proceed and um, the idea of, of really developing the ontologies, the harmonization, um, the standards that uh, for the field uh, is really critical, and I think this this concept proposal really really puts that um, in in very concrete terms. Um, I guess, and and maybe the concept proposal isn't what needs to specify, um, there, you know, how how much detail should there be? But it really, um, on the one hand, you know, the vision is there, and then there's a lot of you know sort of specific examples of activities. Um, but so between the vision and 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 those activities, I feel like there's a lot of space that needs to be filled in terms of um, the strategies, um, governance structure, and how you know how 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 to facilitate such a wide ranging um, kind of uh, activity. And really, you know, what what are the first steps? What how do you prioritize uh, what to do? Um, even just thinking in terms of the many domains that are covered, and you know, you you, you should you sort of um, outline them as as you know four main areas of the the um, uh, physical, chemical, the, um, the 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 social, uh, socioeconomic, the lifestyle, and I forgot the fourth one was, but anyway. Um, you know, within each of those, of course, you know, there are people whose whole life career is on one specific, you know, set of, of dietary, uh, you know, intake or, uh, you know, certain types and things like that. So, you know, 
um, where where do you where do you begin to 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 put in those definitions and um, and maybe Trevor's last point about you know start with some specific um, you know one specific outline one specific area and really go through the whole process there and and use that as a model system um, may be helpful um, the. I, again, I think the conceptual framework is 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 there, um, but some of the steps to get to it, um, and I don't know. In, in terms of the relationship with the global initiative, and particularly the initiative in Europe, um, uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with Trevor that first let's get everything organized here and then reach out. I, I think there's 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 probably a lot of they're a little further along, maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, but it seems like this should be starting very global. It is, you know, the title is global. So let's be global about it um, from the from the outset <clears throat> and, um, and and be working not just with this what's happening in Europe, but, you know, probably there are things. Uh, and I think there was a uh, allusion to um, uh, a, a Japanese effort as well. So um and then there are individual people doing exposed omics in, on every continent so um that inclusiveness from the beginning i think would be really important and um and really you know figuring out what is our relationship to to those others is is it is is this are we the leaders of this in the world or are we a a community along with a lot of other communities out there and uh and how we um how the Institute and NIH as a whole approaches that I think is 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 very important. Um, so I, I I think that shouldn't be put off. Um, but otherwise, you know, I concur with um, uh, everything else <laughs> that Trevor said. Um, as I often do, I always feel he's often got his hand up early, and I think, oh yeah, he's going to say what, exactly what I'm thinking, and sure enough, he does. So. <laughs> um, Anyway, yeah, so I think moving forward and, and putting a little more meat um, in terms of those those initial organizational um, and governance kinds of and strategy part um, between vision and, and vision and go or goals and um, some specific kinds of activities. I do want to say that the the round robin um, laboratory kinds of things is I know is really key and that back in the day there was a period of time I did a lot of work on PCBs and not being a bench person, um, I was really, it was real education for me to learn that um, actually the round robin did not show much harm. Like there was not good concordance across laboratories with, you know, split samples and, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, people often put down the epidemiology of asking questions and the inaccuracies and biases you get there. But um, the, the bench science uh, also has lots of issues. So uh, um, I, I remember talking to a biostatistician who's when I told him what I was doing, he said, oh, I don't deal with human data. It's just too messy. So <laughs> go figure. OK, that's that's about it for my my comments. Uh, just one additional uh, comment, if I may. So I don't want you to misunderstand. I am supportive of a, a global initiative. But I'm thinking to myself that by the time this U24 goes out on the street and you get applicants in and they're reviewed, there's a time window there. And that time window could be used effectively by NIH to think about how it wants to oper operationalize exposomic research so it's ready. Uh, Andrew Geller is up first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that presentation and and, and for your comments. Um, I, I very much support this effort. I participated in the summer workshops and the follow up. Um, I will say, though, as as users of exposure science at, at EPA, um, many of my colleagues have resisted adopting the exposome as of yet, in part, I think, because of the need for that proof of, proof of concept, as 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 Trevor, as Trevor discussed. Um, I, I think there there are some things that absolutely will need to be included, things like non-targeted analysis, um, where we are looking at PFAS, the myriad PFAS compounds and other emerging contaminants 
um, thinking about the early biological responses and um, operationalizing these and searching for cumulative impact indicators and our need to quantify cumulative impacts, particularly across domains in the exposome. Um, I think there's probably space in here, even as we think about NIEHS for the, for the SRP, given um, especially the need for kind of guideline studies and standard analytical methods and standard practices. Again, at EPA, we've got a lot of experience with these you know, cross, cross lab studies. We, we need to standardize these. We put out SOPs for various analytical methods and, and, and that, that whole task is an important one. And it's one that's actually carried through very much through programs that apply at Superfund sites. Um, uh, that I mean, that's the reason we need to really kind of, uh, you know, leverage all the efforts to think about to look at what others have been doing and uh, and see what we can do together. Yeah, thank you very much, and, and, and Michelle, you'll see that I'm now referring to you as the Superfund Research Program. <laughs> uh, Rick, you're next. So, how are we doing on time? We have time. Actually, I'm wondering, Gary, I know that you've been very interactive with the European Union and some of the global efforts. So do you want to make any comments about what uh, what you're hearing today? And it's we want I think if, from my point of view is that we want to make sure that we're not doing something that is duplicative or or doesn't synchronize well with the global effort. Yeah, so there, there's been a lot of efforts on the European side to get more of this harmonization. Um, one of the key steps was uh, one of the European infrastructure grants, one of the ESRIs was awarded around exposomics. It's called IRENE, and there's like 20 institutions involved in it, including Columbia University. So like U.S. partners can be part of it. But like I'm sitting there with a U.S. foot in the door as an academic, not with any national authority, whereas all the other units are, they're like their national hubs and things. So I think that from a credibility standpoint, it would be very good to have something that's more of an NIH level entity that could bridge with that. But uh, but we have been working, but we have multiple collaborations, multiple colleagues in the US working with these European teams and in Japan. Uh, and so I think that like intellectually, there's a lot going on, but in in Europe, like they have like national level hubs that do this, and they say, "Well, you're representing your country." I'm like, I can't say that. Like, all I can do is say my university, if that. Um, so, so I think that this sort of structure would be very helpful to do that. Uh, this new what you showed about the the call that they have about their global coordination thing, like that's kind of the same thing. Is that there's been a lot of research projects, but actually someone focusing on the harmonization and the standardization. The things that no one really wants to do like that's the fact that that's in process now is great and to have something in parallel uh, but you know even if something like this was underway in the u.s just saying that this will become a partner of that i think would be very helpful to show that there is like a u.s uh, contribution to that side you know in a similar way like with on the human genome side it wasn't just universities that were part of it it was a it was a national effort that went into it so so i think that we have you know many of our NIEHS funded investigators are part of many of these other projects in other countries. So we have a lot of connections, but it's been very informal. I think it would be very useful once, once the whole concept of exposomics uh, emerges and it, it becomes part of the NIA and uh, NCI and other N, uh, NIH um, ICs. We we'll want to make sure that we, we address some of the issues that Trevor brought up. You know, good standardization. Let's make sure that when we measure the exposome using a set of technologies, uh, that we're actually measuring things that can be seamlessly integrated into a central data repository. You know, I think, for example, Richard, of the whole issue with uh, telomeres, you know, it's actually pretty sobering to think that all this data is being generated. And it's not abundantly clear that the, the, the methodologies that different labs use are, are actually measuring, you know, things that can be directly compared. So the, these are just things that we we have to take on, and I think it's it's time that we take these on. So I think as Trevor indicated, it's an important this is important to do, and so maybe this is it's very timely that we start you know, pulling these things together. And I want to uh, Richard, you looks like you want to have a response to something. 
Well, I, I think it's a, it's a great initiative, but I was struck maybe it was on close to the very first slide on the question what to measure. And we, we then and, and maybe because it's so complex, we didn't then spend a lot of time trying to figure out how we're going to operationalize that. But it's just, it's stating the obvious. That's a huge, huge challenge. Because it, the short answer, we talked about it, it's one word, it's everything. But but to go from there to oper operationalize everything um, is we think is going to be an enormously difficult ever. But but it, it shouldn't be so intimidating that we don't start. But I don't know if anyone has a thought or strategy or maybe in the European effort, do we, do we have a beginnings for how to prioritize what to measure? You know, I think what you've seen in Europe is, you know, first the sort of geospatial information. There's so much data that's freely available on air pollution levels and light and all these different things. And so if you have geocoded samples, like right away, you, you want to take advantage of that data that's existing. And then I think there's widespread agreement to measure as much as we can in biobank samples. Like so that, and the question is like, what does that mean? Like what, <laughs> what sort of analyses are done? But there's certainly some approaches that have kind of percolated up as being, you know, some priorities there. Um, but I think that's the sort of combination is that if you have strong biobanking samples and you have good geospatial information, that lets you get that external information, but then you're actually measuring things inside the body that, that help you link back up to the sort of multiomic and phenotypic information that we often have. So I, mean, I think that there's definitely multiple places that you could come up with, you know, a top 10 sort of list of approaches to use just to kind of set some priorities. But there will be a lot of discussion around each and every one of those items. Well, and I could give you just a, a brutally applied um, need, which is the need to define a fundamental set of environmental exposures and social determinants of health for things like cumulative impact laws that are coming down the pike. So New Jersey has passed an environmental justice law. They've de they've defined 26 indicators um, of environmental exposures and some social determinants of health to determine disproportionality and disparate exposures. These kinds of things are coming down uh, again, these these are going to be used to make decisions about permits and about regulatory levels. Um, and and so being able to take the vastness of the exposome and 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 do some kind of factor analysis that gets us to uh, a tractable set of indicators is is got very, very applied uh, needs and consequences. So in the interest of time, Richard I'd like to um, okay, okay. I'm sorry, but these are all, all, all great responses. Just what we've seen as a potential complexity as we talk about the very um, complex and fine grained geo positioning exposome uh, metrics, you've you, you really defined an individual almost as, as uniquely as by a sequence. And, and so how you how you take advantage of, which you must, individual data while while protecting issues of confidentiality, as, an, as another one that we're, we're, we're coming up against and I think needs to be solved. So I'll give the last comment to Trevor and then I'll call the vote. So in terms of what to measure, uh, the three things that come to mind that are very tangible right now is, as was mentioned by Gary, geospatial analysis, the biobank, but one very important ingredient not mentioned is the electronic health record is combining those three things together that will able, be able to see if there's really proof of principle. So Trevor, just a, a question for you is to what extent, uh, relative to electronic health records, to what extent do physicians ask their patients, where do you work? What are the things you're likely to ex be exposed to? So is, isn't that a bit of a challenge if you're using electronic health record data? So, uh, at Penn, we've been thinking about this for some time now, and it's very clear that physicians are getting busier and busier and busier, and they do not have the time in the day to ask these detailed questions. But we can develop surveys for these questions that people could take electronically before their visit, and they can do it in home. I do see a hand on the Zoom from Lynn Goldman. Lynn? Yeah, I mean, this has been a long-term concern. And, and Rick, it's not just whether or not the physicians ask the questions, but most of these um, EHR records don't even have a place in a standardized way to record the information. 
It might end up in some kind of a narrative context where you'd have to use some kind of machine learning or something to root it out of there. But um, these EHRs are just not set up to capture social determinants nor environmental determinants of health. And there are many people who have been working on this. It is not a new issue and, there, and it's not an issue that has been um, disregarded. I think particularly the CDC um, is involved um, right now, um, but you know, many people are involved. I, you know, the, the core of it, the crux of it is that um, in terms of, you know, what was the impetus behind the EHRs was not to do population or public health. It had to do um, with clinical um, medicine. And the fact is that there aren't good, um, there's, there aren't good guidelines in clinical medicine yet uh, to incorporate social and environmental determinants of health into clinical care. And uh, nor, nor, nor they incorporated much, you know, into uh, billing and some of the other um, uses that the EHRs are applied for. So I, I, I think it, it would be good for NIEHS and I could certainly help to make some connections uh, to get more involved in kind of the larger uh, world of people who are trying to work um, to improve the entire system for collecting data uh, for public health, including environmental health, including using the EHRs, but there are other data as well that are important. And Irv, I saw that you 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 lit up as well. So let's uh, get another. Oh, comment. I was holding off because you had said that Richard was the last one, and so I hadn't raised my hand. But I was, we'll, we'll, we'll just extend the lunch break a little bit. I think this is a healthy discussion. So, okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, I mean, I think you know we're coming back to that issue, which which I mentioned of the prioritization being really essential here, and. Um, I like the, the three that Gary and Trevor put together. Um, I did want to say something about the um, environmental part of that, the, 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 the one that's maybe, um, actually, Andrew was saying in New Jersey just passed that. Well, California has actually been doing that for a long time now. <laughs> we, we've had this uh, Cal Enviro screen, and there's now an, a, a national one that EPA has put together. Um, and uh, it includes, um, you know, it uses a lot of census data neighborhood level down to the block level, which is a pretty small geographic unit um, with, you know, lots, many, you know, all of those questions that are on the census uh, related to, that do really relate to social factors and so forth. And it's, of course, grouped data, so there isn't the, the privacy issue. Um, and it's now been incorporated into many of the laws that are coming out of Sacramento. Uh, because the the one of them said that the um, I believe it's the the people who are at the in the lowest most disadvantageous in the, that twenty five percent need to receive forty percent of the funding for all of the sort of services type of of uh, you know money coming out of the state, uh, and which is now starting to actually happen, and uh, it's really exciting. Uh, but I, I think that, that those data are, are extremely valuable. And I actually talked to um, our vice chancellor for uh, health. Um, I, I showed him the Cal Enviro screen. I sat down with him one time and he got very excited. And um, even <laughs> I didn't even quite realize he mentioned something to me. Oh, we're working on that. Uh, and then uh, next thing I knew, I got a, an email saying that all of our UC Davis Hospital um, EMR uh, records are now um, are, are now linked to the Calvin virus screen data um, for uh, you know for clinicians and of course then the question is will clinicians use that um, in clinical practice but he was saying look now we have it for the 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 um, research. Uh, as a as part of our research base, so when we do uh, studies of of the patient population, we now have it already linked um, to all of the the metrics that are in in the Cal Enviro screen. So that's the it's the kind of thing that you know I think can be happening um, elsewhere. And you know, there's a kind of proof of principle, proof of concept that that we'll be trying to demonstrate. So. Thank you, Erba. Uh, so on that note, I would like to call for a motion to approve the concept. I so move. Thank you, Irva. May I have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Terry. Uh, if the council members could please vote in the electronic council book. 
Okay, thank you. We have quorum. Uh, so uh, given that we are a little bit behind schedule, I'd like to propose that we start at five after one. So uh, take a 30 minute lunch break uh, and we'll resume at, at 105 with our second concept. Thank you.